Good evening. Welcome, everybody. My name is Abelardo de la Pena, Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, welcoming all of you to En Casa con la Plaza. En Casa con la Plaza is our three times a week presentations, demonstrations, conversations, and performances. We've been doing them since, since April 2020 during these pandemic times, bringing the best of our culture and community, art, culture, history from our homes to yours. If you're on Zoom, please, you have our chat feature there. Let us know where you're viewing from. Also during the conversation, make comments, ask questions. You know, we have a, a Q&A a section, Q&A feature that you could use on Zoom and we may take them during the conversation, maybe afterward, but please feel free. Those of you on Facebook, welcome as well. Use the comments section to let us know where you're viewing from and also make comments, ask questions. It's gonna be a great program and we welcome you all. Our sponsors tonight, PepsiCo and Kaiser Permanente. Start a watch party if you're on Facebook. I'll be doing that too. I'm gonna introduce or give brief bios of our presenters for today, 18th and Grand, the Olympic Auditorium story with Steve Dubro and Jean Aguilera. Steve Dubro, born in LA, graduating from North Hollywood High and earning his BA in poli sci from UCLA. For two decades, he was immersed in music as a singer, a songwriter, record store buyer, marketing strategist, and producer for record labels. He moved to New York, 2004, hitting the jazz and eclectic music division of Atlantic Records, one of my favorite labels, under legendary founder Ahmed Erdogan, working with George Carlin, Chris Christopherson, and producing the compilation soundtrack to Americanos Latino Life in the US. Back in LA, became fascinated with the story of Olympic Auditorium, and he'll tell you all about that. He's married and lives in West Hollywood with his wife, Stacy Stutkin, a writer. Also with us tonight, Jean Aguilera, East LA born. He lived, has lived and breathed boxing since he was 10 years old. Hooked when he saw Cassius Clay challenging Sonny Liston for the title of the heavyweight title in 64. As SC grad, a retired bank president, songwriter, East LA music historian. His tireless work has brought attention to the essential contributions of Mexican Americans to culture, history, music, and sports. He's written two books, Mexican American Boxing in LA and Latino Boxing in Southern California. He ensures that the legacies of great Latino boxers will never be forgotten for generations to come. And he'll tell us all about that as well. He's, uh, uh, I mean, he's got awards, Boxing Book of the Year, induction into the WBC Legends of Boxing Museum. Other accomplishments, Human Services Commissioner for the City of Montebello, past president of the East LA Lions Club, too many to mention. But without further ado, let me present to you today's En Casa Con La Plaza guests, Steve Debro and Jean Aguilera. Please come on up, Jean and Steve. Hello. How are you doing? Hello. <clears throat> well, hello to the both of you. All right, well, the format tonight, I'm gonna disappear. I'll be behind the scenes. But Steve and Gene are going to take it over. So please, all of you, enjoy yourselves. And Gene and Steve, if you need any help, I'm here. We'll see you in a little while. Great. Great. Thank you, Abelardo. Yeah. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, Abelardo. Thank you, Steve. Um, great to be here with you, Gene, uh, as always. Um, really happy to be here with all you, all you folks. And I um, uh, thought we'd just kind of lead you in, um, show some clips talk about the film, talk about the Olympic. Um, with Gene here, we're gonna be focused on boxing mostly, but happy to take questions uh, later about any uh, aspect of the Olympic auditorium history. Um, and uh, Gene, did you have anything to say before I uh, start the, the presentation? No, I just wanna, uh, just wanna say uh, that we, we all went to the grand premiere of 18th and Grand, your movie that you produce it produced and directed uh, at the Violent Theater uh, what, about two weeks ago, Steve? Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and it was uh, it was on a Thursday night and we had, uh, you know, such people as uh, Tom Kenny, Square, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, Carlos Palomino, Danny Little Red Lopez, 
We had the mayor there, James Gomez from La Habra. We had all sorts of people there. And what a night that was. It was sold out at the drive-in. And Steve, and, and we owe a lot to you for all your hard work that you've done to put this movie together. And, and I know because I've lived it with you. Yeah, and no, I couldn't, couldn't, have, couldn't have done it without you, Gene. Um, so without further ado, hopefully I won't screw this up. Um, I'm doing the screen sharing and uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get this started. Uh, okay, I'm doing that and then I'm gonna do this. And then I'm gonna do uh, this. Uh, I have a couple of things, sorry people. Uh, no, oh, and I needed to do that first. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, so um, first I just wanted to thank um, uh, Abelardo, John Zimena, and the La Plaza team, and thanks to everyone watching. Um, I wanted to start with a clip that gives everyone a chance to get a vibe from uh, of what the Olympic was like on a big fight night. So without further ado, let's uh, let's give that a try. As a kid, the Olympic Auditorium to me was a little bit scary. Large crowds, loud crowds, the sound reverberating in that place was deafening. Next quick decision, the victor being bombarded from all sides. As coins are showered into the ring. Uh, the main place where people get hurt here, and it's surprising, is that our fans have a wonderful habit of throwing money in the ring. Julio Cesar Chavez. Bueno, es que la verdad fue, fue una pelea muy cerrada, fue un peleón y la gente empezó a, a empezar a, a aventar monedas. Nunca me habían aventado dinero, la verdad. After an exciting fight, everybody around Winsa automatically ducks their head down because they know that at least $100 in small coins will go in that ring. There were definitely hazards working at the Olympic Auditorium as a ring announcer. It was when they were unhappy, they would throw things other than coins. In the Olympic, you better not have made a mistake. If they were unhappy with the decision, the beer would come flying out of the balconies. You would hope that it's beer. They saved me a trip to the bathroom. I urinated into the cup. Randy urinated into the cup. The guy next to him urinated into the cup. Bam, rolled it down. Unless you've been showered, unless you've been peed on, you haven't been baptized. There seems to be a little bit of disagreement here. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that gives a, uh, some of the uh, diverse voices uh, that are part of the Olympic Auditorium, uh, 18th and Grand, the Olympic Auditorium story. Um, so I wanted to just sort of go through a bit of a, the history of, um, you know, how this project started. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to uh, my inspiration for this, uh, Theo Eret. Theo Eret was the house photographer uh, at the Olympic Auditorium from the mid 60s to the early 80s. Um, and I was introduced to his work by the journalist named, a journalist by the name of David Davis. Um, you know, having grown up in LA, um, you know, Theo's work, uh, it really sent me into uh, great memories of boxing and wrestling and uh, roller derby, watching TV, uh, you know, as a kid in the, in the 60s and 70s. And um, his images just, just uh, enthralled me. And, uh, you know, they were larger than life. Um, and of course, the number that all that became indelibly etched in uh, my memory, the phone number from the Olympic, Richmond 95171, as I'm sure for many of, of, of you as well. Um, uh, that led me to the story of Eileen Eaton. Um, I was really struck by her story. She was the remarkable woman who ran the Olympic for nearly four decades. She was a singular figure in boxing and wrestling history a pioneer whose story had been nearly forgotten. And the more fascinated 
the more I dug, the more fascinated I became. Um, eventually, I reached out to her son, Jean LaBelle, and, uh, and we began a conversation, or actually a series of long conversations in which he gave me a lot of great information, and uh, we began a, a, a friendship. Um, which then got me into the history of the building, which opened in, in, the, in the 1920s and, um, and at a time of explosive growth, corruption and racial conflict in Los Angeles. Um, I realized the Olympic was a hub where people came from all over the city. And so, you know, it became a way of telling an LA story that hadn't been told, um, particularly a Mexican American story and I'd always felt like that uh, the Mexican American story in LA had been um, really um, not properly uh, represented. Um, so through that, um, along with Tony Peck in 2014 and a team that gradually grew, I began interviewing people connected with the Olympic Auditorium. Um, one led to another. And uh, the, these relationships became you know, deeper than just a simple interview subject. Um, they became lasting friendships and, and, uh, and real great relationships in these communities. And um, you know, one of the strongest ones is the man on the right, Gene Aguilera, um, seen here with Bonnie uh, and Danny Lopez. Um, so, you know, uh, I thought it would be a good time to show a clip where Jean is uh, featured that gives a sense of uh, LA history and uh, I'll play that next. During the 1940s, Eileen needed a new boxing star. The Olympic Auditorium catered to the Mexican American crowd in East LA, we had the West Coast swing era, zoot suits, pachucos. Dressing differently, talking differently, for some Angelinos meant un-American. Mexican youth in Los Angeles in 1943 were attacked by servicemen for being un-American, and that led to the zoot suit riots, as we know, in downtown Los Angeles. We lived in Boyle Heights. My dad was just walking down the street, and the cops would harass him. Let me see your idea. Where are you going, and what are you doing out here? And it was for no reason. I got a call over the radio that a bunch of pajucos were liable to start trouble. So that's that kind of the indignities that we experienced in, the, in those days. Um, so that leads me to Jean, and uh, Jean has two great books, and um, um, so I, I wanted to, I have a gallery of some of the greatest fighters of the history of the Olympic, and I wanted to sort of cue them up and let Jean talk uh, about these great boxers that he's documented so beautifully in his books. Um, so Jean, I will roll some images, and you can... Okay jump in and, and, and talk about these people. Thank you, Steve. There we go. There was baby Arizmendi. Uh, maybe the first Mexican boxing star. Uh, he started, uh, there's rumors that he, he began his boxing at the age of 14, which is, you know, way under age. Uh, he was a kid, but, you know, and he started his career in Mexico. So they might have done something to, the, to his, his ID to, to get him approved over there. But uh, a lot of people say Baby was the first uh, world champion from Mexico. And uh, there's different theories. You know, a lot of people say Laurel Salas. A lot of people say uh, it was uh, Juan Zarita. But Baby Arismendi can lay a strong claim. Uh, he was, uh, he was from old Mexico, and uh, he won the featherweight title here at the Olympic Auditorium. And uh, he also had a five-fight series with uh, the great Henry Armstrong, Homicide Hank. He won two out of the five, and all these accomplishments got him into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota, New York. One of our greats. 
Baby Arismendi. Here we go. Look at look at old Manuel Ortiz, the El Centro farmer. Uh, such a I would that this is one boxer, Steve, that I wish I could have met. I, I he was just a little bit before my time. I wish I could have met him and maybe he got in a drinking spree with him because he was famous for that. Uh, Manuel Ortiz came on in the 40s, which I think was the beginning of the the uh, the the golden era of Los Angeles boxing. Uh, Manuel Ortiz was the Bantamweight world champion for eight years, and he had 21 title defenses, which was second only to uh, Joe Lewis at that time. And again, he's in the uh, enshrined in the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Uh, this was the era of World War II there in you know, the beginning of the 40s. And it was, like, uh, like I said in the clip, it was the, the, the West Coast swing era. Uh, this guy ushered it in and just one of my all-time idols, Manuel Ortiz from El Centro. Here we go. There, I, I think that's there, Enrique Bolaños, because yes, it's covered. It yes. Our screens are our screens are covering. Uh, uh, but that's Enrique there with his uh, brand new DeSoto, right? Yes, that's Bolaños, and Enrique Bolaños was just. Everybody has told me uh, people from from uh, Bill Kaplan, Don Frazier. Uh, Kiki Baltazar, they've all told me that I Enrique Bolaños was just the the boxer that totally captured the imagination and love of uh, Mexican Americans in Los Angeles. Uh, he he definitely brought in the West Coast Swing era. Uh, that was the prime time there in the in the 40s, and he had that Pachuco swagger. He, you know, there was a zoot suit period, and 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 people people were their khakis pressed tight. I mean, Enrique was just the idol at the Olympic Auditorium, and and he had. I mean, when he fought, people lined up around the block and and down the block to see him. Just a, a complete complete uh, boxer, never a world champion. He fought three times for the title. At, the, at Wrigley Field, because uh, when he fought Ike Williams, the great lightweight from uh, Trenton, New, Jer New Jersey, uh, they, they, those fights were too big for the Olympics, so they had to have him at the at Wrigley Field. And unfortunately, uh, uh, Enrique did not win the title. He got shut out in his three attempts uh, there. But Bob Resendez, who was like almost family with Enrique, and God bless Bob Resendez, who recently passed away about a year ago. Uh, Bob said that that a lot of people uh, claim that that Enrique did win the title in the second fight with uh, with Ike Williams. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're we're heading into the fifties, and there in the middle is the one and only the original Golden Boy, I say, Art Aragon. There he is with a couple of beauties there from the 50s. He looks like he's doing his road work and he got a little distracted by these uh, these uh, LA beauties there. And uh, Art Aragon, when he came into the scene, he, he, came, he actually, he defeated Enrique Bolaños at the Olympic Auditorium. The first time was uh, on, on uh, Valentine's Day, 1950. And that was the the, the passing, the passing of the of the mantle, and uh, as in terms of being an idol in Los Angeles, from Enrique Bolaños to Art Aragon. Art beat him twice, uh, became just the the grand attraction, H held the records there at the Olympic Auditorium. I think Steve in the movie, there's a, he stands by a a, a chalkboard and, and it's like a, he had a million dollar gross receipts at the Olympic, I believe, right? Yeah, he was he was. Uh... Both he was the star of LA. The the according to according to Bill Kaplan, the the uh, had the the most uh, the most popular fighter the, the of the of until until Art um, I'm sorry until uh, the uh, 
the golden boy, the current golden boy. <laughs> right, right. But uh, so so anyway, Art Aragon, I, I want to tell this really interesting story that, that everybody should know. When Art Aragon started in LA in the, in the early 50s, he, he was the only show in town uh, other than the Los Angeles Rams. The Dodgers had not arrived yet from Brooklyn. The Lakers had not arrived yet from Minneapolis. The Angels were still a minor league team. So Art was the, was the only game in town and people just jammed the Olympic Auditorium and the Hollywood Legion Stadium to see Art because he was just, a, he was a character. He was, he, he became the villain and, and this is all by his, his own admission and his own intent. He became a villain so people would want to go see him to see him lose. And uh, uh, so he would pack the Olympic and he would make more money for that. You know, he, I'm, I'm sure he has some kind of gross, gross deal cut out with, uh, with Eileen Eaton. But Art was the man of the 50s, the only game in town other than the Rams. And, and Steve, in the movie, I, I, everybody's got to see this, uh, this movie, 18th and Grand, that Steve has put together. Uh, Steve interviewed a genius move, Mamie Van Doren, who was Art's girlfriend at that time. And some, I won't spoil some of the lines that she says, but they're just some of the greatest lines in the movie and in film history, <laughs> what she says is just incredible. But she, uh, Sorry. there we go. Didn't mean to jump ahead, sorry. That's okay. We slid into the great Armando Mondo Ramos. Love this guy. I was a personal friend of Mondo. We went to dinner to the Del Rey. Uh, I took him to see the Midnighters with the lead singer Little Willie G in West LA at, at Rhino Records. So we were personal friends. He would send me videos. He'd call me every day at work, and I miss him. You know what? It was a weird story about Mondo here. We talked almost every day, and at, when I was working at the bank, I, I used to go and get my coffee in the in the coffee room there, and and we'd have the LA Times delivered every morning. So, I, you know, I'm flipping through it while I'm drinking my coffee, and I get to the obit section, and guess what? Mondo Ramos is right there. I, I I I lost it. You know, I that's how I learned about Mondo's death uh, in the newspaper and. Uh, those days, you know, not, we weren't all on social media where, where, where news travels like wildfire nowadays. But in those days, and as soon as I got back to my desk, the, the phone starts ringing off the hook. Hey, did you hear Mondo died? Mondo died. Oh, my God. And I went to his uh, memorial at, uh, at, in Wilmington at the Longshoreman Hall. They had that beautiful robe that you see there. The red, it's a red robe. That uh, that now Frank Aragon is is has in his in his uh, museum. Uh, Mondo was a character, the two-time lightweight champion of the world, the youngest man to ever win the lightweight championship was Mondo Ramos, uh, and he carried Los Angeles on his shoulders during the '60s when when boxing took a little bit of a downturn in. Uh, what happened was uh, 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 Davey Moore died at the uh, Dodger Stadium and a few other things happened. Uh, Emil Griffith fought uh, Benny Kidd Perret and he died. So boxing was a little bit on a downslide. But when Mondo came on the scene in about 62, more or less, when he started, uh, he just brought boxing back up. And for these reasons, I think Mondo should be enshrined in the International Boxing Hall of Fame without a doubt without a doubt for the reasons I've just uh, stated. And there he is with his... Uh, I'm sorry, I keep jumping the camera. Sorry, Gene. That's okay. That's okay. Here we are. I've, you know what? I've never seen this picture. I thought I would surprise you with this one because I, I knew you would uh, appreciate it. Yes. You're, I, there's some stories I got here. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, on the left is the great Ruben Olivares from Mexico City. The gold tooth Mexico City playboy, I call him. I, that's one of the chapters in, in my books. And uh, there he is with a great Danny Little Red Lopez. Just uh, these guys, I, I think it looks like they were pumping up the fight 
at their upcoming fight. They eventually fought. It was a non-title fight. Ruben had Danny down on the ground, and uh, Danny got up, as was his custom, to get up. Once you once knocked Danny down, you woke him up and look out. Danny got up and knocked out Ruben in, I think, about the seventh round. But uh, that's a fantastic picture right there. It, it's, uh, I love it, love it. I, I, need, I, love to, I love to surprise you, Gene. Yes, I need an eight by 10 of that. I don't know who that guy back there is. I think it's the guy that Danny just knocked out. But uh, you can see there at the ring, probably at the Olympic or the Forum. I'm not sure yet. But uh, uh, Ruben, let me tell a quick story about Ruben. Ruben was a four-time champion of the world, two-time Bantam, two-time Feather, won all his titles at the Forum. And why do you say that? Why the forum? Because he was just too big of an attraction to uh, to put him at the Olympic. So he went down the 110 freeway to the forum, fought for Don Frazier and George Parnassus there, became a huge star. He was uh, fought at the forum 22 times, which is a record. And uh, just Ruben, he's like family to me, my compadre, Ruben Olivares, with a great Danny Little Red Lopez, without without uh, sliding Danny, one of their, our greatest fighters from LA. Danny came from Utah originally and uh, settled in in Alhambra and just was one of the huge, biggest stars ever at the Olympic Auditorium. Here we go. This is Bobby Chacon on the right. Look at him with the Olympic sign there in the back, and he's knocking out Turi Pineda. Uh, Danny, uh, Bob, excuse me, Bobby was undefeated at this point, and uh, Turi was an upcom up and coming fighter from uh, Mexicali. And there's Bobby, just uh, another picture I've never seen. Is this a Theo uh, picture? Yeah, that's a Theo, Eric. Yeah. Oh my God, just the guy just captured the spirit of, uh, of the Olympic Auditorium. And there he is, pay, giving a pasting to old Turi Pineda, Bobby, a two-time world champion, and also from Silmar, California, and one of, one of our greatest, greatest fighters in Southern California. I love Bobby. I knew him. Uh, tell a quick story real quick, little sidebar here. Uh, we, we had gone to, me and Ruben had gone to, Ruben Olivares had gone to this event. And Bobby was there. And Bob and Bobby wanted to hang out with us. Bobby wanted to hang out with us. So we were partying pretty good. And we came over to my house. It was on a Friday night. And and there I am. Oh, I got Ruben Olivares on the phone. Look at that. Excuse me. So we, anyway, Bobby and Ruben are at my house, right? Just the three of us partying all night. And this went on to the next day, went on to Sunday. And I said, Bobby, I got to take you home at some point. And there we go, trying to find Bobby's house out there in the, in the San Fernando Valley. It took us a few hours, but we found it. We got him home safely. But uh, it was it was like weekend at, it was weekend at Bernie's, weekend at Geno's with these guys who had fought three times. You know, I had them at my house. It was it was. Quite the memory. Never told that story. Thank you. Oh my God, Carlos Palomino. There he is. Look at him with his WBC belt. Carlos uh, uh, came from Mexico at, at 10 years old. Uh, settled in uh, in uh, in Westminster. He lived there for the longest time. Lived in Huntington Beach. Uh, such a great champion the welterweight champion of the world for three years seven title defenses and it, he was uh, uh one of eileen's eden's fi favorite fighters carlos was uh the a hard-working guy who who developed a style he was like a doctor in the ring you know he he would just bury his left hook in in the in the opponent's liver hit you with a right cross and you were gone uh, I went to see Carlos fight many times at the Olympic Auditorium. Uh, it was always fun to see him. 
we became friends and uh, he was at the screening uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was there and uh, Carlos, uh, Carlos retired in 1979 after a loss to, uh, to Roberto Duran at the Madison Square Garden. And he retired for 18 years, decided to make a comeback at age 47, believe it or not. In 1998, he came back and won four fights by knockout. I was all I was at all his comeback fights. We would go out, have dinner afterwards and margaritas till the sun came up. And Carlos on his fifth fight, it was at the Olympic Auditorium. And uh, it was a Bob Arum top rank uh, promotion. And he fought Wilfredo Rivera and uh, almost pulled it off. It would, I think if he would have won that fight, he would have had a title shot at age 48 against maybe Oscar De La Hoya. Who knows? They were in the same weight class there at the welterweights at the time. But Carlos, you know, I just the fact that he made that comeback, he was always kept in great shape, made that incredible comeback at age 47 and won four out of five his last five fights. He's in the Hall of Fame in the Canasota as he should be. Well, speaking of Canastota, Gene, here's a yes. Here we go. Look at this. Here we are. Let's uh, let's both chip in on this story. Uh, Lupe Pintor got inducted in 2017, I want to say, and and as me and Steve had been talking about about. Uh, the movie and and who he was going to put in there and and I had mentioned to him that I was at the Olympic the night that that Lupe Pintor fought uh, Johnny Owen for the title of Wales and unfortunately it was a very sad tragic night and Lupe Pintor knocked out Johnny with Marty Denkin as referee and Johnny was out uh, Bill Kaplan says it best that when Johnny fell, it was like, it was like a, a puppet when they, when they cut the strings, when they just, he just fell in pieces. It was, I was there, it was very sad. Uh, I went home that night, couldn't sleep because I knew they carried him out on the gurney and, and uh, everybody knew that it was, didn't, everybody knew that he wasn't gonna make it. And he died three days later at a hospital here in Los Angeles. So. So that's where Steve basically ends the boxing in the movie, in the 18th and Grand movie, with, uh, with that fight with Lupe Pintor against Johnny Owen. And there's Steve there on the left, Lupe in the middle, me on the right. And Lupe had, had been playing soccer a few weeks before the Hall of Fame, broke his leg, and there he was in, in, on a wheelchair all weekend, poor guy. And... So I said, Steve, you know what? If you're going to get Lupe Pintor, he's going to be inducted in Canastota. You got to come out there with me. So there we go. Steve goes out there with Tony Peck, his film, his film guy, and uh, it was it was not an easy thing to to get Lupe because he was so busy. He was being inducted, so the Hall of Fame over there had him busy. I mean, 24/7, and we did like a James Bond uh, type thing when he when he got off the bus. We, we, I said, Steve, pull, go. when you see me, I'm going to call you, come wheeling around. We're going to throw him in your car and we're going to take him down to my room at down the block at Graziano's. And, and, and we got him in my room and uh, it turned out great, Steve. Yeah, I think there were about 15 people in that, in your yeah. little tiny room. <laughs> little uh, tiny. And that was the bed. It was, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, great stories like that where we, uh, we had to improvise to sometimes to get, uh, to get uh, what we needed to get. So, well, thank God you got Lupe because it might not have been easy, you know. Yeah. Well, it was it was a it was a great interview, and and th thanks to, thanks to you. Um, so that's the um, that's the end of the the, uh, the 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 cavalcade of great boxers. Um, I was just gonna move on. Uh, we'll we'll move on to questions. I had a couple things left that I wanted to uh, just kind of put forward. Um, we're, we're happy to take some questions. Uh, just to give you an idea, the film right now is, and I'm sure the question is, where can we see it? Um, we're going to give you uh, 
uh, a special a special special access um, tonight um, to a pre-sale uh, for a virtual screening of the film. Um, we are the film is is currently playing festivals. It is not widely available. We're doing events, and um, so uh, I will soon be showing that. One way you could support uh, the film if you're interested, um, you know, is uh, everyone needs a shirt, don't they? <laughs> um, so, um, you know, Freddie Blassie, you know, you, not everyone can walk around without their shirt on. So there's a classic Olympic Richmond 9 5171. If you go to uh, 18thandgrand.com and look in our merch section, you can, uh, you can uh, purchase a shirt. Um, we also uh, have, uh, you can sign up for more information for when uh, DVDs, uh, Blu-rays will be available and there's, uh, and when the film will be out um, it, near you. Um, so um, we're really proud that we were selected to be uh, uh, part of the San Diego Latino Film Festival. Um, that screening is gonna be a ticketed screening on March 19th at 6.30 p.m. The tickets are limited. Um, we're giving you guys a, <clears throat> a first shot at uh, purchasing them. And we'll put that link in the, uh, in the, the uh, chat section uh, when we get a little further. Um, so uh, thank you all and um, we're happy to take questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Steve and Gene. Uh, thank you. This, this was, uh, uh, Gene, I mean, you got so many compliments here uh, from, oh, thank your, you. from fans out there. We have Nate, Nate Wren saying, Gene Aguilera was so great in that film. Uh, one of the most interesting, entertaining, and knowledgeable people you'll ever meet. Very, very talented writer, MC, and narrator. And he loves the 007 tactics that definitely made the movie great. <laughs> So I guess yeah. he's one of the lucky ones that, is, that has been able to see the movie. Um, yes. So uh, uh, Steve, if you could stop the share screen so I could get all, all three of okay. us here on the screen. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working on it. All right, uh, good. Let's see, stop, share screen. This is, these are things that I, um, I'm learning. Share screen, okay, let me, uh, okay, sorry. All right, in the meantime, I want to give shout outs to, uh, to Debbie Taigo from Ventura, Chumash Land, Ruben Lucero, from Orange, California, who joined us today. Thank you so much. Teresa C. Gonzalez from City Terrace, Bob Barnett from Huntington Beach. Uh, those, are, those are just some of the that, uh, that uh, joined us on Zoom. On Facebook, we have uh, Arturo Rodriguez with a question. Did Corky Gonzalez from Denver, did he ever fight in LA? I'm not sure that we have to get back to you on that one. Okay. And, and Rosa Eshak, I, I hope I got that last name right. It, why wasn't John Jordan included? Well, that's a good question. Um, Don Jordan is an incredible character um, in LA boxing history. And um, he, he really deserves his own, <laughs> his own uh, documentary. Yeah. Uh, Don Jordan um, uh, was an LA fighter who um, won the world title at the Olympic Auditorium and was indirectly, well, actually fairly directly responsible um, for uh, bringing down the mob. Um, he was connected to the mob and his fight, um, his two fights against um, Virgil Akins, um, in essence kind of uh, killed the mob in boxing. Uh, it sent uh, Blinky Palermo and Frankie Carbo. Frankie Carbo went to Alcatraz and, and kind of um, destroyed the, the mob's grip on boxing. They never went away completely, but um, the reason is I couldn't cover everything. And I would love to, you know, my, my goal, my dream is to expand this out and do more, um, you know, I have so much story, so much footage, so much more wrestling, roller derby, boxing, uh, punk rock. Um, but I wanted to make a film that was um, tight, uh, that that was um, that that was coherent and cohesive, and that anyone could enjoy. And so um, I couldn't put everyone in, um, and that's been the 
you know, uh, the one critique that I've had is, you know, from people is, God, I want more. And um, I would rather leave people wanting more than wanting less. So yes, Don Jordan's story should be told. Um, I'm hoping it will be told, um, but uh, I'm sorry I couldn't include him. He certainly deserved to be in the film. Yeah, because uh, also somebody, Anne-Marie Hernandez asking, how about night, big night train Lincoln? Oh yeah, uh, oh. you know, there's so many, you know, yeah, there's there's a whole lot. There's no, so many no. great. There's so many great fighters um, from every era of the Olymp the Olympic, and so many great, you know, I mean, the so many great wrestlers, uh, you know, going back to the, you know, um, Enrique Torres, uh, you know, uh, you know, we cover Gorgeous George, but there's Baron Leone, and there's, uh, uh, you know, so many great great wrestlers that we couldn't get to. So many, um, you know. So many, so much great roller derby. Um, you know, it, it's it's um, it's an epic story, and I had to make choices. And the story, if I didn't, if I included every fighter, I couldn't have given the social context. I couldn't have given the LA story, and I couldn't given I couldn't have given the Eileen story. Um, it was very challenging film to make the narrative all cohere and feel um, cohesive, and I. I did my best and I think, um, you know, I have to obviously have to live with the choices that I made and I'm, uh, I feel like I did the best I could with what I had to tell the story that I wanted to tell and how the Olympic was kind of a hub for the city. Oh, um, no, I to totally agree with you, uh, Steve. I, I, there's a lot to unpack uh, when you're talking about the Olympic auditorium. So I think I see a, a Netflix uh, miniseries coming here. Uh, yeah. let's, let's, let's real, hope so. real quick, if you could, uh, the little, uh, if you could start, uh, let's see, what is it? Stop share the same place where you where you shared the screen. Click on that again. Okay. Um, my 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 problem is I'm hiding. Let's see. I need the view. Yeah. Oh, if you could uh, view options, do uh, let's see. And this is to technical stuff. It happens every time we have an in Casa con la Plaza session. Yeah, I really, I, this is, this is one where I'm, I'm, I'm in the pre presenting mode. Yeah, just go on fit to uh, and view up where it says view options. Uh, I think it's um, stop full screen or something like that or fit to window. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's okay. Well, we're doing okay here. And, and you're right about having to cover so much boxing, so much wrestling. Roller Derby, the Roller Derby uh, segments are so entertaining. And uh, I remember watching it on, on KTLA, the uh, Thunderbirds and, uh, they, all right, you got it. The yeah. Thunderbirds, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's got an Olympic uh, auditorium story to tell. We have a, a question here from, um, let's see, we have, let me pull that out, uh, asking about, in the, when did the Olympic auditorium, when was it built and when did it first start seeing action? Well, it was built. It was built in uh, the con construction broke ground in 1924. The building opened in August of 25. Um, so, and it start. It was. It was. It's called the Olympic. I mean, you learn. This is stuff that you'll you'll learn in the movie. But it was called the Olympic because the um, it was it was built for the 30, 1932 LA Olympics, and it was where the boxing and the wrestling and the weightlifting, I believe, was was also held there. Um, so. It started, you know, bo boxing. It had an opera season in the beginning. It was built. Um, it was built. You know, LA was growing rapidly, and um, you know, many buildings, many important LA buildings, were built in the twenties. And um, the Olympic was uh, was designed as the city was was growing, and it was sort of to compete with New York to be a grand arena, ten thousand four hundred seats, which was you know, uh, massive for its time in LA and uh, right in the center of downtown. Um, and there were all sorts of shenanigans. I mean, it was a time of, of, of widespread corruption. The building uh, went way over budget and um, uh, ended up in foreclosure uh, in the first year of its existence. So um, it struggled, you know, the building had a lot of success but it struggled um, really until Eileen Eaton took over and it actually then struggled after she left. So she was the glue that held the building, uh, the, the successful promotion together for nearly four decades. 
All right. Uh, let's see. We have somebody here asking about. Uh, you mentioned a boxing museum. Uh, wh where is that? Well, it's a. Uh... It's owned by my friend, uh, Frank Aragon, and it's, uh, he has plans. He, it's housed right now in, 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 at his home, but he has plans to, uh, to talk to city officials and hopefully get a, a structure built. Uh, he's got an incredible collection of robes, posters, gloves. Uh, I mean, if, if you walked into his house, it, you, you'd be you'd be floored if you're a boxing fan. Uh, to me, it's what it's one of the greatest collections here on the West Coast. And uh, let's hopefully that uh, after this the, the COVID thing uh, that that Frank can uh, can get that that idea and his dream back on board. And I hope to help him on that. All right. Well, uh, Bill Stansberry, he saw Jerry Quarry fight George. Scrap Iron Johnson in the in '66 is Jerry part of the movie? Uh, Jerry, Jerry's uh, you know Jerry's image is in the movie. Jerry's, uh, but we don't go into Jerry's story. Um, it was an again a matter of 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 uh, you know of choices of particular boxers that embodied in different eras. So um, rather than try to be comprehensive. Um, even though, of course, Jerry has a great story, um, is, you know, was a star, uh, fought at an incredibly competitive uh, era of heavyweights and fought some of the best. And, and, you know, though he didn't, you know, he lost to Ali, he lost to, um, who else, Gene? Fra Frazier. Frazier. He lost to Bob Foster. Uh, you know, he lost to, the, he, like Steve said, he, he unfortunately came up in the era when there was just one belt and some of the all-time greatest heavyweights uh, in history, Ali I mean, Frazier. He was somewhat undersized for, for, that, for that division right. at the time. If there was more of a cruiserweight or a, an inch, a middle, you know, a, uh, you know, another division where um, he wasn't so physically... He was a great boxer and, and certainly deserves it. I'll just put it that way. Um, but but I but he's he's not his story is not um, told in the film. All right. Well, right. I think I think he beat uh, one of my homeboys, Joey Orbeal. Yes. And and Ernie Shavers, he he one of the great hardest hitters of all time. He took out Ernie Shavers brutally. Um, so he had, he was a great fighter, no doubt about it. He well, deserves great. his own little segment someday. All right. Well, Chris Smith is asking, he has a question on which boxer fought at the venue the most. Who was the most popular one there? Was it, was it uh, Danny Lopez? No. Um, boy, that, that's what I mean. Boxers back in the, you know, in the, in the uh, early days fought a lot more often than they do now. So I would, I would only be able to guess. And I would say, you know, it could be someone like Baby Arismendi. Um, it could be someone like, uh, it could have been Bolaños. Um, you know, Aragon, 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 As Ruben Lucero just, uh, put a chat there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, uh, Danny fought cause Danny fought for the Olympic, but then he fought for the forum. So uh -huh. he, 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 um, his career began at the Olympic and then, um, you know, uh, another interesting story is sort of the, the birth of the forum and how that was, um, that was a competitor to the Olympic um, and drew away some of the fighters um, that had fought, uh, traditionally would have fought at the Olympic. All right, well, Abel uh, Gervasio is asking on the billboard behind you, Steve, uh, it says Ernie, La Ernie Ladd versus who? Oh, let me move. Um, <laughs> can you see? I can't see, let's see. Ernie Ladd, oh, versus Tolos, John Tolos, of course. <laughs> uh, the Golden Greek, one of the, uh, one of the great, uh, attractions uh, at the Olympic and his feud with Freddie Blassie was one of the high points um, where they ended up uh, building up a feud between Blassie and, and Tolos and it ended up uh, at the uh, at the LA Coliseum uh, where 25,000 it was one of the largest gates in history um, 25,000 people showed up to see uh, Blassie get his revenge on Tolos so that was a, a, a great a great historical moment at the Olympic and uh, a part of their promotion. 
and as we know, uh, later on in, at the at the Olympic, we had uh, your music coming in, uh, particularly the, the the punk bands, your hardcore uh, uh, metal bands. Would did you ever attend any any of those, Steve, in your music uh, career? No. Um... I was having a conversation with Gary. Gary Tovar was grilling me about this the other day uh, when we were talking and he was like, so you were my, you know, you're the sort of right age for my, you know, for my audience. Did you come? I was like, I went to many of your other Golden Boy shows and I was, I was, uh, you know, I was very, uh, I was on the, I, I was on the edges of the punk rock scene and I went to tons of shows, but by the time it got to the Olympic, um, the nihilism had reached such a peak that, uh, you know, for me, I was more into post-punk at that point and into other kinds of stuff. Um, I, you know, I, I grew up with a dad that was into bebop and I was into punk and blues and stuff. And I worked at record stores and, and that. So I, um, so I never went to any of the hardcore shows. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the one I really wish that I'd been at was the uh, PIL, the first PIL show with uh, plugs and Los Lobos opening up uh, in 1980, which was not Golden Voice, but that was uh, uh, from uh, all I hear was uh, was an epic, uh, an epic uh, show. Oh yeah, here it didn't go too well for Los Lobos uh, when they came out with their acoustic guitars, but I'm sure <laughs> yeah. PIL uh, brought down the house. Yeah, I I, I was there when uh, Black Flag and uh, Dead Kennedys, and I think the Descendants. Uh, that was. I was in the balcony. I did not get close to that floor because uh, no, uh -huh. I, I, would, I wouldn't be here now. That's yeah. That I, that that was a. Uh, I think that's the show that uh, Raymond Pettibone did the flyer for, of with Black Flag in uh, wearing wrestling onesies, um, and uh, I think uh, Husker Du were were on that bill too, and the Minutemen. So it was a really um, that was and Forty Five Grave, if I recall correctly. But that was a. Uh, um, yeah, that I would have loved to have gone to that show. I, I just uh, saw in our chat room here that uh, Tony Marcico of Los Cruzados and before formerly The Plugs uh, sends a shout out to everybody and he performed there at punk shows at the Olympic. Oh, I'd love to hear his show stories about that that show from because uh, I from what I understand, uh, Tito Lariva um, was the one who suggested Los Lobos uh on that bill and help put it together which seems like an act of performance art and um and uh subversion in the first place which i think pil were because i think everyone was you know the, the sex pistols never played in la so um everyone was really gearing up for a punk show and pil were really more a sort of art dub um you know uh not a punk band and so i i think that uh the energy of the crowd um, you know, met something that was not exactly what they were looking for. And so anyway. I, I always thought as Tito just kind of serving Los Lobos as a sacrificial lamb up there, you know. <laughs> Let's get rid of the competition here, boys. <laughs> but uh, Los Lobos, man, they, they braved it out as, as long as they could. And uh, uh, they and braved it out and then they, you know, they left a little early, you know, it got a little crazy with the bottles and and I think uh, 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 Hidalgo flipped uh, off the crowd and they stormed off, but it was it was a weird pairing there. And they're the ones that are that are still standing. So I, I guess right, right. The, something the right. Word there. Yes. <laughs> well, we have a, a big question from Ruben Lucero, who you mentioned. Steve, when are we going to see Olympic Auditorium Story Part Two? Oh <laughs> uh, well, you know I'm 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 very much want to do uh, uh, more. Um, I, I think the story is, was really, um, you know, it, it, it begs um, the, what, as what I said earlier was many people have just said, you know, it was great, I want, I want more and we have more. And it's really just a matter of, um, you know, finding the right uh, platform, finding the right um, you know, financing, whatever it, it takes, first things first is, we need to find a home for this this film, um, and but I'm very optimistic because um, because people are responding. Um, the thing that's been beautiful is uh, both the press and the people who've 
seen the film um, are really responding. And so I'm, I, I feel uh, hopeful, gratified um, that this, um, this long process, because it's been a very, you know, hasn't been easy. It's been a long process to tell it. I'm just proud of it and I'm really glad it's out there. And uh, thanks Ruben, I, 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 I sure hope to be able to tell more. And uh, I think there's a lot of chapters really of this story. Um, and it's, you know, it's such an LA story. It's really, um, uh, it's a unique LA story. All right, well, thank, thank you so much to the both of you. Uh, one last question here from Nate. Ren. Yeah, can, I do a, can I do a final word before we oh, sign off? No, please go, no, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead with question, okay, first of all, the question here, uh, Gene and Steve, what was your favorite event that you've attended at the Olympic? Gene, I'll let you go because I want to put the I'm going to put up the uh, the the link to the the pre-order of tickets. Okay. In the while you do while you tell your story. You know, I I that's a that's a good lead into what I was going to go and uh, say here. Uh, I went to I used to go to the F Olympic Auditorium on Thursday nights. I mean, you could get in for five bucks if you wanted to sit up upstairs in the balcony. And, and many times I sat on the first row in the balcony, which is like you're, you're it seems like you were just right up above the, the ring. Great seats. Uh, you know, for 10 bucks, you could sit there ringside, you know, and and one, one thing about the Olympic, it to me it was like a community gathering spot there on 18th and Grand. I mean, uh, you'd have one section where you'd have all the, the Chicanos there, Mexican Americans. You'd have another little section of the of all the gamblers or mob guys. And after each fight, the, they, they usually sat in about the second or third row. They had two rows complete in one section. So after the fight, they'd all stand up and turn around and face each other, and you'd see all the money exchanging hands. I mean, it was just a sight to see. And then you had celebrities. You guys, you had guys like Ryan O'Neill, you had Burt Reynolds, uh, Richard Pryor, uh, uh, Connie Stevens. I mean, there was just a, a just an A-list. Elvis even went there one time, right, Steve? Yes. Uh, well, that goes, I mean, it goes to that. Yes, Elvis, Elvis uh, George, yeah. the, the George Rodriguez, um, yes. Uh, the famous photographer uh, who's we we licensed some of his issue, his images for 18th and Grand, and he has a you know he has an interesting connection to the Olympic as well. But uh, he uh, he said I have a picture of Elvis at the at the Olympic, but it's yeah. not it's not that good. Uh. Oh well, it's it's Elvis. So we 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 got the picture, and it's it's kind of a great picture. The problem is, is it just, you can't, there was no way, you can't tell he's at the Olympic and it's just hard to use it. So there is a picture of Elvis at the Olympic. The other thing, um, uh, Gene posted, a, a there was an obituary uh, yesterday in the LA Times about a, 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 a fighter named Paul Hernandez. A coach, who, a coach. Uh, who died of COVID um, yeah. and Paul, Gene did, Gene did a, an event at the East LA Library um, and Paul Hernandez was there and um, was talk, talk, we, he pulled me aside and we were talking about the Olympic and another gentleman pulled me aside while I was there and he said uh, that he had a funny Olympic story which was he was, at, he was drunk, he was a young, uh, a young man, he was drunk, he hadn't gotten, uh, I guess he wasn't that experienced drinking alcohol. He was at the urinal at the Olympic and he was kind of like, he was kind of staggering around and he, he, he was, he just about stepped on the guy next to his shoes and these, well, so some security guards pulled him away and he looked over and it was Elvis. And he, nearly, <laughs> he nearly peed on Elvis's blue suede shoes. So that was the, uh, that was the Elvis, sorry, I digressed, but. No, uh, no, that's good. That's a good was, story. It, just, it was a free association. Um, and I didn't want to make light of, of Paul, um, and I wanted to bring, I wanted to just sort of, uh, you know, bring some, um, I, the COVID has hit the boxing community hard. And I, I wanted to acknowledge that, um, particularly in East LA, it's, it's obviously hit the Latino Mexican American community really hard. And I, uh, I just wanted to, uh, I, seeing Paul's, uh, 
uh, obituary yesterday really um you know it just it just uh it 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 hit me and i just wanted to um i just want us all to think about that and i i, I want this uh i hope this this film is um if nothing else it's a, it 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 it's about loss in so many ways. I think the film um, is about what we had and what we've lost, and I don't want it to be too nostalgic, but I think um, that um, uh, that that sense of 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 meaning of of treasuring what we have and treasuring the people that we have and valuing um, the people that we have is really important. And I just wanted to uh, just wanted to say that. No, th yeah, no, thank you, thank you for that. Because uh, uh, you're right. You know, the the whole reason we're we're even doing this online, we've been uh, at this now for almost uh, the full year, is because of the the pandemic, which is uh, you know impacted so many of us uh, in, in personal ways and professional ways. But it's it's art, history, culture, uh, which which La Plaza is all about. That is that is bringing hope to people. That is bringing connectivity. And your film. Even though it's filled with, you know, it's black and white archival, it's in it, it has an immediacy to it that you could just, it, it's like it, it, it's happening now. Uh, uh, the, the stories of, of passion, of uh, the stories of, of physical prowess. Uh, no, it's, a, it's an incredible film, and I, I really uh, recommend that everybody check it out. We, we put the link on our Facebook page there. We have it here on, uh, on the chat. So pre order it, be one of the first to see it. Uh, because it's gonna it's gonna go go wide, uh, but but you're gonna really enjoy it. Uh, Gene, any last word? The question is, when's your next book? Oh God, my next book, uh, my third book will be out on uh, July 27th uh, this year. Uh, I'm real excited about it. I'm happy with the way it's going, and uh, and I'm sure that uh, that it'll be be loved by everyone in the boxing community. Uh, it it specializes uh, of. Uh, the Latino boxers, Mexican, uh, Mexican American, and uh, there's got it's got some stories there that are they're amazing that that uh, I wanted to preserve, and hope they never die. These stories. Well, thank you. You're you're uh, a historian. Uh, I'm in a walk-in encyclopedia on just this, not just this one topic, but I'm I'm sure that there's some music stories that you 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 could write a book about that as well. Because yeah, you, yeah. If you ever want to do a, a show on that, Abelardo, let me know. All right, we're, we're gonna uh, hold you up to that. Well, thank all you right. all so much uh, for tuning in. All of you that, that tuned in, we got somebody from Vashon Island out there in Washington. Thank you so much. We have people, local local folks who showed up tonight on En Casa Con La Plaza. Uh, of course, your friends out there, Ruben Lucero, Felicia Stansbury, her question, her grandfather, Rudy De Leon, dedicated much of his life to boxing. Mondo was always around when we were kids. Growing up, there were so many stories of many of the men you spoke of tonight. My grandfather, my dad, his son-in-law spent many nights at the Olympic. Thank you for this trip down memory lane. Well, th thank, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, I think one of the beautiful things, and I, I was saying this to, we were speaking when we were speaking earlier, Abelardo, is that this is a generational thing, um, that uh, I get messages all the time um, you know, from people through our social media, uh, which uh, hopefully everyone here follows. Um, uh, it's the Olympic Auditorium Project on Facebook. Uh, it's Olympic Auditorium on Instagram, and uh, same thing on on uh, on Twitter. But but uh, it's a generational thing. I we, we get questions all the time about and uh, about their uncles, about their grandparents, um, and. Uh, yeah, it's it's the Olympic. There's something powerful. It's not just, um, I don't know. It's not Staples Center. Um, no disrespect to Staples Center, but the history of the Olympic was so deep and so entrenched in the community because um, our the fighters came from the communities. Um, they came from our neighborhoods, um, and so did the fans. So that's right and Wilmington had its, its share of bo boxers including the great Mondo Ramos which you which you really highlighted in, in the in the film well we're, we're out of time here um again we, we posted the, the the link to the show there uh on the chat and also on the Facebook page you could buy Gene's books at our online store La Plaza Tienda so check out La Plaza Tienda I put the the link there as well uh 
and, and thank you so much for that. If you if you came in late or if you want to watch this again, you could we're recording it. It's going to be posted on our Facebook page. It'll be on our Facebook page. We're also posting it on our YouTube page where you could catch all of our 120 plus in Casa con la Plaza sessions, including this great one. It's at uh, youtube.com slash la plaza la. And you could catch uh, all of them are in Casa con la Plaza uh, sessions there. If you want to know what's coming up, let me just give you a little taste of uh, our next sessions. We have uh, this Friday, uh, What's So Funny? Comedy During Quarantine, featuring some four great comedians, Kim Cogden, Vanessa Gonzalez, Eric Rivera, and Danny Vega, moderated by Big Brown Dad, also known as Carlos Aguilar. The next week, on Wednesday, we have a, a little change of pace in the music scene with Tres Souls Boleros Relive. They'll be playing some of those boleros that you remember from days of old, Los Panchos and, and, and others. And that'll be here on En Casa Con La Plaza. Go to our website, lapca.org to catch all of our listings of, uh, thing, of our uh, sessions to come, our cooking demonstrations, our performances, our conversations, politics, history, culture, we got it all here. And tonight we had wrestling, we had boxing, a little bit of punk and a little bit of roller derby, but to catch it all, click on that link, check out the 18th and Grand, and I'm, I know you're gonna have a good time. Any last words, Gene and Steve? Well, uh, Steve, it was a pleasure working with you on this movie. And uh, you captured the soul of uh, the Olympic Auditorium there in, in downtown LA in the shadows of the 10 freeway. I pass it by so many times, at least once a week I'm passing by it. I always look over there and there's a, a sense of uh, sentimental uh, feelings that I have. Uh, when I see it now, now it's a Korean church, but I see it now and it's like if you went to a wake and you see the body and the coffin, that's how I see it when I see pass by the Olympic Auditorium. I see the body there, but the soul is gone. And, uh, you know, I went there so many times that, uh, that uh, you know, a lot of a big part of my life, a big part of my youth was spent there. And uh, I'll never forget the place. And, and Steve, you're keeping the memory alive of the great Olympic Auditorium of Los Angeles. And thank you, uh, Abelardo and Steve, for having the show tonight. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, so the, the screening just, it's, it's, uh, it'll be the, the 19th, which is a, a week from Friday, uh, the San Diego Latino Film Festival. Uh, I posted a link in the chat. I'll post a link uh, a, on the website for pre-order of tickets. It's limited um, and just wanted you all to know about that. Uh, thank you all and uh, excited for uh, everyone to see the film. All right, well, thank you to the both of you and thank you all of you that, that tuned in tonight. We hope to see you again real soon, uh, starting this Friday, seven o'clock. Uh, register on Zoom uh, via our Facebook page or, or watch it on Facebook Live. So. Buenas noches a todos. We'll see you real soon. Y muchas gracias. Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.